Hello, everyone. Um, I think we'll, we'll try to follow the time-honored Berkeley 10 tradition, but no worse than Berkeley 10. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, um, for coming here today. Uh, we're going to start a new lecture series with the support from uh, the Vice Chancellor for Research Office and uh, Kaya's indomitable logistic ener logistics energy. Um, Josh Bloom uh, from the Astronomy Department is going to be our first speaker today. Uh, but we hope to make this a regular lecture series where we talk and we bring people from multiple disciplines, uh, hopefully to see each other, to discuss things with each other about the problems that um, the problems theoretical, practical, computational, scientific, from any perspective that the flood of quantitative data is kind of presenting to, to all of our fields. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to be opening it. Uh, the we're going to try to keep the format very uh, conducive to this kind of discussion. So we'll have a short talk uh, by Josh. Then we will have a panel discussion with a few members that I'll introduce later. Um, and then we'll open it also for discussion with the rest of you. So uh, start thinking about multiple questions, because this isn't going to be a 50-minute lecture with three minutes for discussion, but rather lots of time for discussion. Um, so Josh Bloom, uh, is a, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce him. He's a, a good friend and a colleague. Uh, Josh is a professor in the astronomy department who has done some incredible work. Um, and uh, you'll see some of those highlights today. Um, Josh uh, got his master's degree at Cambridge, his PhD at Caltech, uh, has a CV the, 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 size of, the size of a phone book. Um, in, um, he won the 2010 uh, Newton Lacey Pierce Award from the American Astronomical Society. Um, uh, he was a Hertz, both a Hertz and a Sloan Research Fellow. Um, he's concluding his sabbatical right now with uh, being promoted to full professor on campus, and uh, I'd like to congratulate him for that. Um, and just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that Josh pulls off, a couple of years ago we were getting together in my office uh, on a Monday morning to start working on a grant, and he shows up at 10 a.m. completely bleary-eyed, and I asked him, what's, what's going on? What, what happened? He said, oh, it was a rough weekend. I had to write two science papers this weekend. And I said, <laughs> what do you mean? He said, yeah, we collected some data three weeks ago. We spotted a very rare uh, ev astronomical event, uh, and we wrote two science papers about it over the weekend, and I thought, hmm, that's kind of odd. And yeah, lo and behold, about three, four weeks later, science lands on my desk, and indeed, there's two back-to-back -back papers from Josh. By the end of the year, he had assembled uh, 52 papers in the, in the previous calendar year, six or seven of which I think were sort of nature, science, PNAS. Um, and yet, he's deeply committed to the university's um, educational mission. We've been having a bunch of discussions lately about data science, and I'm, I'm always thrilled to hear how he keeps coming back to the question of how does the university do this kind of work while keeping the core of our educational mission up front? How do we engage new scientists? How we, do we engage the next generation of people for whom these tools are going to be critical? Uh, and together we're teaching a boot camp in the fall and trying to basically develop some of these tools for, for good research. So I'm going to leave you in his capable hands and uh, keep your questions in your mind since there will be plenty of time for that. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, it's not often that I get to welcome people with my astronomy hat on of a day of such great astronomical significance, of also worldly significance. Um, welcome to the first day of summer. It's the summer solstice, if you, in case you haven't been paying attention. Um, I think uh, this lecture series is incredibly timely, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. What I'm about to talk about is not really meant to be all that exhaustive in introducing you to the kinds of things that we think about um, in the context of the time domain in astronomy. It's actually really not meant to be kind of all that didactic. I, I really want this to be um, considered as a kind of warm-up um, for this upcoming discussion. This is, in some sense, uh, about a domain science that happens here at Berkeley. Um, and it, one of the things that we've all been thinking about recently is whether uh, this thing that we're calling data science, it's clearly a thing, right, in the same way that big data is a thing. Um, but, you know, is it an intellectual endeavor in and of itself, or is it sort of a collection of hodgepodge tools that enables data science to happen? And we hope over uh, this lecture series, obviously you're not going to answer this in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, um, that we get a chance to start thinking about that collectively and have you as a, a community kind of contribute your ideas to this. Uh, what I know is that, uh, so there's data science and then there's data driven science. And I know that data driven science is, is a thing. Um, I'm a data driven scientist and so is um, Galileo when he uh, had uh, this very nice uh, set of time series data of, um, of his pictures of what are now called the Galilean moons, uh, his discovery uh, was obviously um, fairly transformative. By the way, I'll, since Fernando brought up this, uh, this thing about science, 
um, I'll sort of bring in a little anecdote from when I was a graduate student. And uh, there was a new postdoc in our group from uh, the University of uh, Washington. And I was asking him, you know, what does it mean to have a really high impact paper? You know, how do I get my stuff into science or nature? And he said, well, the way that you do it, and if you look at most science or nature papers, this is what it is. You're expecting to see no things, and then you saw one. Or you're expecting to see one thing, and you saw nothing. And you know, what you wind up seeing is that sort of the vast majority of the uh, amazing science and nature papers that I've been involved in. Um, if that's the case, then you know, there would have been four new things when you're expecting zero for Galileo. So that probably would have been pretty highly cited. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to introduce this just as sort of an early example of astronomers thinking about the time domain. There's obviously some grand challenges, not where we're kind of pointing our uh, sort of new instrument in instead of pointing it at the horizon and then saying, oh, let's see what happens when I point it up, which is what Galileo did, right? Telescopes were invented for the purposes, military purposes. Um, and he said, what happens when I just point at things that, that should be round and shouldn't have anything else around it? Um, and he found you know, something that was completely unexpected. There are grand challenges in the time domain um, in the context of being a data-driven scientist that are obviously important. Um, for instance, finding an Earth-like planet uh, in a one-year orbit around a sun-like star is one of these grand challenges, and the race is, is, is really on. Um, and this is a hard problem, not because it's hard to articulate uh, as an astronomer or anyone else, everyone else could have uh, come up with this question. But when we ha finally have the instrument that's going to be able to give us the data to answer this question, which star is the one that has an Earth analog ar around us, um, you know, the data don't look so great. Uh, and they look wonderful if you sort of zoom out, but when, if you look at the, what's, what, what the uh, sort of units are on the y-axis over here, this is in uh, parts per million. So this is changes of brightnesses of stars that are basically far away from us within our own galaxy. And we're seeing these things flicker on the scale of what the sun does you know, with, uh, with star spots and, and even at even smaller levels. And finding uh, an, an Earth move in front of that sun for just a brief period of time, waiting another year and having it come in front again, and then waiting another year and having it come, come again, you're looking for signals of this occultation that are at a similar level to the amounts of just sort of the ordinary ripples that you get from ordinary quiet stars. Um, so this is a really great statistical problem. Even though we can ask this question uh, in a, you know, a fairly simple way, actually getting at this answer and finding a really good set of candidates and then convincing your colleagues that this is actually um, something that's uh, statistically um, significant is, uh, is very important. Um, and, and in some sense, what's interesting about this is this is one of those examples in astronomy where computer scientists and statisticians are having a very big impact, doing signal processing on this amount of data. And by the way, this is only, um, what, an order sort of a month or so of data. Uh, Kepler's been uh, collecting this data on sort of one-minute timescales for the last three years. So there's a tremendous amount um, basically pointing in the same part of the sky, something like 150,000 uh, stars. It's a lot of data, um, but, but more than just the, the amount of it, it is really just sort of the quality of the data um, and getting into really the, uh, the sort of needle in the haystack work. Um, so, you know, who's going to make this discovery, I think is an interesting question. Is it going to be somebody from a stats department? Is it going to be somebody from a computer science department? And computer science is important in this context because you're having to do trials in, um, in frequency space, uh, millions or billions of trials on a, on a single object. Um, and if you do all those trials, you know, that's obviously computationally expensive. And now a number of different groups who are looking at the same data are sort of starting to bring in um, GPUs to try to speed this whole process up. So will it be an astro person, a stats person, or will it be a group of, of, of astro stats and CS that, that actually kind of make this grand discovery that convinces everyone they have it? Um, and you know, I think a more important question is, does this actually really matter um, what that group is? But what's very clear is um, around the world, um, stats and uh, computer scientists and astronomers are coming together and trying to answer these grand challenges um, in, uh, in fundamental ways that push really the envelope, not just of astronomy, um, but of these other disciplines. So there is a meeting that's ongoing right now um, at, uh, at SAMSI, 
which is uh, the Statistical and Mathematical uh, Science Institute um, in the Research Triangle. And they are asking this question right now about, about this data set. So maybe we'll hear something about it in about a week or so. Uh, this is not uh, really um, that close to the work that I do in astronomy. Um, I've been uh, interested in, um, in finding uh, black holes and looking at the ways in which black holes um, belch and burp and, and change their brightness. Uh, the, the hard part here is not, not sort of finding one needle in the haystack, but actually identifying um, in a statistically rigorous way, where you're going to use your precious resources to do follow-up spectroscopy, as it's called, of um, all the different candidates in the sky. Um, so uh, here's an example of how a black hole um, on the other side of the universe winds up um, bel bel uh, belching and burping. Uh, it's a, a, what we call a light curve. It's similar to the one you saw before, but now the uncertainties are much, much larger. They can be of order 10 or even 100% of the actual measurement, um, which gets us into another interesting statistical regime. And you see that the data is not regularly sampled anymore on one-minute time scales. It's sort of sparsely sampled. Um, it's irregularly sampled. And you notice uh, we've observed this in five different uh, uh, filters. Um, essentially different colors, and you notice sometimes we have some colors and sometimes we don't have other colors. And what, um, what others uh, realized is that the way in which quasars um, sort of burble along is, uh, it can be described as a damped random walk in a statistical sense. And so we asked the question, given a large catalog of light curves of everything on the sky, um, can you identify and separate out the, um, the stars, which change in different ways or don't change at all, and, um, and all the, the burbling black holes. And so this was um, bringing in um, some uh, interesting uh, uh, Bayesian theory uh, to come up and ask this question in the way, um, I'll try to phrase it uh, as well as I can now, essentially given a light curve of a source, is it behaving like a damp random walk? Um, and then if you can couch that in the form of probabilities, uh, then you can um, see how well you're doing on known data sets. And what we're able to do is just in the time domain, in a, in a, single, um, in a single color, we're able to separate out known quasars or burbling black holes um, from, uh, from stars. And we had a really nice uh, separation where if we make a cut somewhere between the, um, the blue and the, the red curve, uh, we'd get a very nice uh, complete sample and an almost 100% a, uh, almost a, uh, pure sample. Um, so that was a very nice example of bringing in um, a whole body of stats knowledge that I actually didn't have myself. I was fortunate enough to work with somebody named Nat Butler, um, who was a very stats-minded astronomer. Um, and uh, he was able to bring some of these tools to bear. But you know, even if I was able to articulate that question and say, can we use uh, the time domain only um, to figure out what, uh, what's, a, what's a quasar and what's a, a star, um, I, I was not trained in a, in, in a way that would have um, allowed me to answer that question in the way that we were able to as, as a team. Some of the other things I think about trying to um, classify stars and different types of events um, across a very large and ugly taxonometric tree that's been set up over the last 150 years or so of variable stars. There's about, about 100 different types of variables, and sometimes things look uh, the way that we observe them just because of orientation effects um, and you know, what sort of uh, wavelengths we're looking at them. But sometimes they, they appear to change and act strange because of real intrinsic physical effects. The, te the taxonometric tree that describes how um, variable stars are sort of connected to each other is this interesting hodgepodge of um, uh, really sort of physically motivated statements and um, really sort of empirically uh, motivated statements. But anyway, um, what you see here on the right-hand side is an example of four different light curves of different sources. Again, some of these are actually pretty regularly sampled, but you notice the second one from the bottom, so-called beta Lyra, doesn't have very good sampling um, at all. And you also notice the very different time scales that we operate on. We've got things at the bottom from uh, changing on, a, on, on sort of uh, hour time scales, up to days, up to months, and up to year time scales. So astronomers are really working on all these different time scales. It'd be tempting to say um, that if I just had a, a, a really good template library of all these different um, variables, all I'd have to do is just do some matching. 
The problem is that every star is variable in its own way, and even if it truly belongs to a certain class of stars, when you get into the nitty-gritty, perhaps if you observe it with Kepler, you notice that they're all different, right? It's sort of the, the Anna Karenina of, uh, of, of how the stars work, right? You remember that all happy families are all happy in the same way, and all unhappy families are all unhappy in their own way. Um, so all stars might actually sort of fit into one nice class, but when you really get in the nitty-gritty, every single thing is different. And how do we deal with that in a statistically rigorous way is a really interesting question um, that I've been asking. The problem is we don't even have templates for all of these uh, different uh, classes, or at least well-observed templates. Most of the stuff we have is noisy, um, and it has, uh, in some cases, spurious data, that is, you know, if you want to think of it in a statistical way, we've um, incorrectly estimated what our uncertainties are on some, of the, uh, on some of this data. This data is not, just doesn't come from the universe. This is derived, you know, from an observation from a telescope, which has its own inherent flaws. The, the, the light is passing through the atmosphere. That light has passed through uh, all the junk in the universe to get to us. Um, and uh, when we detect this on typically a, a charge couple device, a CCD, or some other digital detector, we have to extract the time series out of what essentially amounts to an image. Sometimes we do a bad job with that. Um, and perhaps most important when we're really thinking about doing inference, an inference that has sort of immediate uh, needs for follow-up to really extract the most science, and that is to take action on those inferences, um, the telltale signatures of that event may not have even happened yet. Um, and so that's, uh, that's very interesting, I think, if you start thinking about how to follow these things up um, in a resource-constrained uh, environment. Um, so what I, what I like about this problem is that it's hard from an astronomy standpoint, um, but it starts really kind of poking at what's, what people are capable of doing in, in the machine learning space, in the statistical space. And one of the things that I'm, I'm proud of is that uh, we were able to get a group together um, on campus and uh, start working on this question, not just as astronomers, but as statisticians. Um, and uh, there's a PhD that's coming out of the group um, from James Long. This is one of the figures from his thesis where he wound up showing that if I train a classifier on, uh, on three different classes of sources on the left-hand side where I actually know the answer, and then I apply that same classifier, this is basically making hard cuts in two different, um, in two different feature space uh, uh, numbers, I wind up doing a very poor job. So even though I have a perfect classifier on, 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 on one satellite, if I then try, try to apply what I've learned from one satellite to another, it becomes uh, essentially a terrible classifier. And that's because the way in which we observe the universe um, actually winds up affecting uh, how we think about it. And uh, that's true in a high Zipperger uncertainty way, but it's also true um, in a, a pretty obvious way, as you see um, here. These are the same classes of stars and yet when we observe them differently, that is, we take data on different time scales with different telescopes, we get different, uh, we get different results. So I'll skip through this. The last thing I just was going to point out um, is uh, sometimes we really want to take action on the inferences that we're meant to, to derive out of the data. We have um, on the left-hand side an example of uh, two so-called discovery images that were done by um, some machine learning codes that my group built up uh, where we're trying to basically find that thing that's in the center. That's a new, those are in the, both of these cases new supernovae and try to do this in an automated way and then use all the previous um, history from before uh, we observed that part of the sky to later on to then come up with a very quick statement about what we think this is and if it's a variable star or it's um, some other type of transient event in our own galaxy, different um, groups within these large collaborations may get excited. But for the collaboration um, that I've been working most closely with, we were trying to basically follow these things up as quickly as possible. So um, here's the hard part is that when you start taking people out of this sort of real-time loop and, and, and trying to do all this inference, you have to be really careful not to, to sort of blow all of your resources on things that just turn out to be mundane, right? You really are looking um, for that next um, high-impact paper. So find the supernova and do it quickly. So don't wait for a year and then go back and look at your data archivally. Then do follow-up, but don't follow up everything. Be judicious about what you follow up. Then do some inference, um, given all the follow-up data that you've gotten, and then, you know, then maybe you win a prize. Um, 
So on the left-hand side, we've got questions um, that, uh, that I'm interested in in the context of time domain and astronomy. What's the, what is truly new in the sky? We call that discovery. We're doing distributed um, processing uh, at NERSC for that um, and, uh, and, and imbuing some machine learning techniques as well. What's the origin once I found something and said, aha, this is interesting. Again, some, we're trying to do machine learning at scale. Um, and it's only going to get worse as we get more data. And then, uh, you know, where are the quasars? Where are the planets? And there we have to bring in some pretty hardcore um, Bayesian stats modeling and advanced signal processing to answer this stuff well. Um, I don't work all that closely uh, with, uh, with others in other domains. We're starting to um, think about working together, and we, we recently were awarded a grant to start thinking about how um, those types of light curves then start applying to um, other domains. Uh, uh, and so seismology and neuroscience are, when I, at least when I look at those graphs, I say that, that could be a variable star of some sort. So there must be something that we can do together. And it's pretty clear we're not going to be able to share much across the domain in terms of influencing each other's science. But um, the techniques that we need all seem to have some sort of commonality. Um, and so I think what we'll be hearing about uh, over the next uh, half an hour or so is, is sort of in that commonality and, um, and what we can all be doing together uh, to sort of improve the domain science. Um, we've been uh, uh, building up the Berkeley Center for Time Domain Informatics, and even though this was mostly an astronomy-only endeavor, uh, we, we decided that we weren't going to have astronomy in the name because we realized that over time we wanted to try to branch out um, to other disciplines. So um, for me, this is sort of the next uh, big step for us. So let me end uh, this uh, presentation with just um, a challenge, and, and, and I'll, I'll try to phrase it as what I'll call the novelty squared problem. If I'm trying to do something novel in astronomy, so I'm, let's say I'm trying to find the, the, the first um, Earth mass planet around a sun-like star in a one-year orbit, um, you know, that, no one would ever argue that that's not a novel endeavor to go after. But thankfully, that's also, it seems to be at least a, a novel problem in the stats and computer science realm as well. And so the, the, those different groups all coming together and doing something novel is the novelty squared. The problem is, this is if novelty is rare, um, if you square this and you require that you bring in, um, say, computer science and stats uh, and applied math to this problem, and it's not actually all that novel to, to those folks, um, and it's, yet it's novel to a domain, um, is that really the kinds of endeavors that we want to be thinking of um, as data scientists? Um, is that truly a data-driven science? Um, uh, and are we just thinking about math and stats and applied math as, um, as, as sort of, uh, you know, just sort of these toolkits that just live out there and all, our whole job is just to find the right one? I, I would suspect that some of the best things that are going to happen um, on this campus are not going to be because you know, somebody from the computer science department teams up with somebody in, in, in seismology and helps the seismologist figure out something they didn't know before. It's going to be because the seismologist found a type of data and a type of question that wasn't easily answered by existing theory um, and existing frameworks um, within, say, statistics. So um, I'll leave it with that and uh, look forward to your questions uh, during the panel. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Josh, for, for that talk. And uh, so now I'm going to very briefly introduce our, our three panelists, and we'll try to spend uh, a few minutes uh, um, in, in the panel discussion. Then we'll open it to the floor. Um, Kaya asked me to remind you all that uh, right after we wrap it up here, there's going to be tea and coffee and cookies outside um, that, uh, so that you can spend some time maybe um, talking amongst yourself. We really are trying to build up a, a community here on campus around these questions. So we have today uh, Philip Stark from uh, the Statistics Department with us, uh, Michael Silver from the Vision Science and Neuroscience, uh, Vision Science Program at the Helen Wells Neuroscience Institute, and Richard Allen from uh, Geophysics and Seismology. And uh, rather than speak any more, I'd like to ask each of you maybe to spend a couple, a couple of minutes telling us a little bit about the kinds of problems that you work on and that interest you, and trying to see how some, some of the things that, uh, that Josh said may tie into either ideas that you have or problems that, where you think you could contribute something. Um, and I'd also like to ask you if you see anyone in the audience that you've either partnered with or that you would like to work with at some point. Uh, and maybe consider uh, either because you think you can help them or because you think they can um, help you out. Uh, and, and maybe try to talk to them afterwards over, over tea and cookies. So, 
Um, do you want us to focus on uh, things to do with time series and spatial series and, and so on? Is that the focus? Today? Sure, sure. On, on, but, but not necessarily. I mean, I, I want to leave it up to, up to you. I, I don't want to be driving the conversation. Should I start? Sure. <clears throat> um, so uh, I had mentally prepared to talk about time series and spatial series, so I'll go that direction. Good. The kinds of problems that I've worked on uh, that involve this sort of tool are primarily in physical sciences, in seismology, geomagnetism, uh, helioseismology, um, cosmology, microwave cosmology, and then some things in Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy uh, for identifying rock mineralogy. So a, a lot of the problems, what they have in common is you, you have a signal that isn't necessarily stationary, but you're trying to recover some stationary property of the object that underlies it. Um, so for example, you want to know something about the interior structure of, of the Earth, um, but what you're observing are these transient things that happen after an earthquake. Um, and what the, the data reduction that's involved is partly trying to separate sort of the stimulus from the response, from, from the, the, the the system that is then responding to the stimulus. Um, in, and a lot of the, the difficulty in this is somehow simplifying the, the physics to the point that you can actually do something um, and then doing that sort of separation of, of what for you that day is signal from what for you that day is noise. In seismology, traditionally, the, the data reduction problem was really uh, addressed very, in a very draconian manner. Um, we just saw Josh put a, a seismogram uh, up there. And what, the only feature that people cared about is where did the big wiggle start, right? So yeah. you, you reduce this enormous time series to, to one piece of information. Where did the wiggle start? Um, so one of the things I'm worried about is uh, to what extent is, that, is treating that and using geometric optics as the approximation for the physics going to give you a biased uh, view of the world. Um, and then as people started to use more other information, so another thing people use is, well, let's somehow look at how the Earth as a whole responds rather than this wiggle and look at the normal modes of the Earth and the normal mode frequencies of the Earth. They do that same thing for the sun and stars. So again, that's this enormous data reduction from these, these time series measured in different spatial places to try to turn it into a time series of spherical harmonic coefficients and then do Fourier analysis on the time series of spherical harmonic coefficients. Um, and again, sort of the goal is both, both data reduction to get to a manageable uh, amount of data and also to separate the response of the system from the stimulus. Um, other data reduction problems on this kind of a massive scale that I've worked on in, in geomagnetism, um, this is kind of an entertaining story. The, the Danish uh, Meteorological Institute flew a satellite called Ørsted. It was launched in 1999 with an expected 14-month mission. It's now been collecting data for 14 years instead of 14 months. Um, but the community, when it first came out, wasn't equipped to deal with the data sampling rate that the satellite was producing. It was producing roughly 100 hertz data, and people wanted to deal with 1 hertz data. So how do you go about reducing the effective sampling rate without throwing away information and perhaps gain some robustness in the process so that you know, um, you know, gamma ray bursts or this or that aren't going to totally um, uh, trash, your, you know, trash your signal and affect what you're doing? So those are some of the kinds of things that I've been working on. Cool. Michael? So I work in the area of human cognitive neuroscience, and uh, many people in our field are interested in fundamentally how the brain works, how the, what sort of principles and mechanisms the brain uses to represent and process information. And in the last couple of decades, we've, as a field, developed a lot of uh, measurement tools and experimental techniques to measure brain activity for, for very, getting very large data sets of brain activity over a wide range of spatial and temporal scales. And I feel like what we really need in our field is theoretical models and conceptual insights to be able to extract patterns from these data. And um, there's two kind of general areas where we need to, we must work with other fields and obtain insights from other fields in order to be able to make progress in, in our own questions. And one is working with people who've studied perception and cognition. So <clears throat> psychologists and psychophysicists who've uh, characterized the basic principles of cognition and perception. And this gives us tremendous insight about what sorts of patterns to look for in the brain and also really helps with experimental design. So, so unlike some of the other fields here, we, we are not relying on uh, you know, events like earthquakes and supernovae that happen outside of our control. We have a lot of experimental control and can intervene in the system. And we can use our insights about how perception and cognition works to design experiments to evoke very particular patterns of brain activity. And this allows us to get a handle on these really enormous data sets uh, and, and not just get lost in uh, so much data not knowing what sorts of patterns to focus in on. So that's one key component of working with other fields uh, to, to analyze and work with big data sets. 
And in others, we just don't know the fundamental neural code, how the brain, uh, what algorithms are used by the brain to process information and to move information around to different areas. And so here, it's very critical for us to work with statisticians, computer scientists, engineers, to have analytical tools and statistical measures to, again, be able to take these enormous data sets and identify patterns, test to see whether the brain uses these patterns or not. So one thing that's unique to our field is we're presented with this highly adapted, intricate, complex brain that evolution has been working on for a long time, and we're trying to uh, unpack the sort of the history of evolution, how it's given us the brain that we have. And so uh, we don't know a priori what the design principle should be or what the algorithm should be. And so it's very important for us to work with other fields to be able to gain computational insights that we can then apply and test to see to what extent they explain uh, brain function and brain principles. Do you guys want to check your mics? I, I'm not sure. Was everyone able to hear the last two speakers? Is it on? Okay. Hi, do, no. do, do we have the mic for the audience for later? Oh, you got it. Yeah. They're on? Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I'm Richard Allen, and I'm a seismologist. And the first thing I want to comment is how exciting it is to hear so many non-seismologists talking about seismology. <laughs> <laughs> we are in California, so, the, so well, I mean, right there's there, a bias. <laughs> so right there, I think, is one of the things that I find most exciting about this sort of effort on campus to kind of get these connections going is because it allows us to kind of exchange ideas. So that was the first comment I wanted to make. A, I just have to, I mean, my PhD is, is in seismology. geophysics, and, and my, my dissertation <laughs> right. is in seismology. But it's, I, do know, I do know that. <laughs> but you're not a seismologist now in the no. sense of, a, that's what I meant. But so, but the comment I want to make is I'm going to add to, uh, to the comments you just heard on seismology. You just heard about the problem in seismology of data reduction. I'm going to, following uh, Josh's last slide, square the problem. Because not only uh, do we have to reduce the data significantly, and we've had to do that for a long time, the amount of data we're about to have is, uh, is about to completely change. So seismology uses typically hundreds of sensors that are distributed over a region. So we use a global seismic network that's a few hundred stations. Um, the Berkeley Seismo Lab uh, runs 70 geophysical observatories in Northern California. Um, and so that gives you a sense of kind of the sensors that we have distributed around the globe. And we can use that data because, in fact, it's an incredibly <coughs> uniform data set as these networks of very high-end, um, expensive equipment have built up over decades. And uh, we have a very sort of formalized and standardized uh, process of gathering that data, collecting that data, archiving that data, which means that it's very easy for seismologists to then go and use it because it's so uniform. So that's about to change because I'm guessing that almost everybody in the room has one of these in their pockets. And these all have accelerometers in them that can also record the ground shaking. So that means that just in this room, there's probably about twice as many sensors as the Berkeley Seismo Lab runs right now. So the, the, that's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your perspective. The catch is that the noise, or the quality of these sensors is terrible. And so the good news from the Berkeley Seismo Lab's perspective is that, in fact, the quality of what you would get from all of these sensors is significantly less than the single instrument that we have on a seismically isolated pier in the basement of Haviland Hall, just a few hundred yards away. So the challenge, that means, is how do we really capture data from all of these sensors that are sat in the room right now? And that obviously means, first of all, a technical challenge in how you actually get the data from everybody's individual phones to a place where we can, uh, can make use of it. And then do we, how do we analyze it? And we have no idea. We, being the seismology community, has no idea how to make use of that data. And so that's the real challenge, or one of the challenges, I think, in our field. And Josh, do you maybe want to, after you've heard your co-panelists, is there anything that you'd like well, to one of the things that wrap that, up with the one of, one of the ways uh, that struck me um, about how I'm hearing the, the sort of neuroscience question phrase is really almost theory-driven. You, you were saying you have a sort of a theory of how things work, and then you set up an experiment um, to test that theory. And uh, I, th I, I think that's different, although I'm not 100% sure, than um, you know, the sort of completely data-driven of something just happened, let me figure out what's going on. Or I have a question, which is, you know, a question doesn't have to have a theory behind it. Um, you know, what is, this, what is this, if I push this part of the brain, does my eye twitch that way? I mean, you don't have to have a theory of why that happens to actually create some sort of causal inference um, that, you, that you wind up believing. Um, and and I, that's wonderful. Uh, I would kind of love to be in that, that place. But what I, what I think of is in, in astronomy sense is in some sense like earthquakes is that we don't know when the next thing's going to happen. 
And um, all we can be is reactive. And the best thing that we can be as scientists from a data collection perspective is set up more and more sensors with you know, as best a quality as we possibly can to just try to capture when something happens so that in, in the future we can go back, and maybe the future is over the next couple seconds or the next 10, 10 years, to go back and try to reconstruct something that we'll call you know, physical, that will actually, after the fact, create a theory about why that, that actually is. Um, and, and so I, maybe this is, I was thinking this is fairly unique to astronomy in the sense that the best we can do is just collect photons, right? And the universe decides they're going to throw these photons at us and, you know, silly for us to not put more detectors on them. You know, silly for seismologists not to have sensors all over the place because, all, you, can, you know, unless you can go in and start drilling, well, I guess you could do fracking, right? But that's another, an, another panel discussion. Um, you know, you're not able to basically create experiments at test theories. Is that true? No, that's true. I mean, you know, it's all about having enough sensors out so that you capture the earthquake when it starts. I mean, people talk about it also looking at things like uh, the uh, processes, the fault rupture processes themselves, where you can actually go and drill. That's the closest that you can get. And you can drill through these things. But the cost of there is just prohibitive. So we're, we're forced to just kind of be in this wait, look and see kind of uh, approach. So I, I guess I see that there's things on different have to do with how rare the transient is. We're, both, we're, we're talking about transient phenomena, and if you're talking about something that's rare like a supernova, where that you catch it at the right time, that's one story, but there's other kinds of transients. It's like you know, the, the sea pounding on the shore creates micro all the time, and you can use that to say, or the sun is convecting turbulently, that's kicking it all the time, and you can observe the, you know, the response to that. So it's, again, you have some of this transient, not exactly stationary thing going on, but you get observations all the time as opposed to observations of, of every once in a while. Um, and so then uh, you know, another distinction is, do you care about what's kicking the system or do you care about the system's response to the kick? Mm -hmm. right? and yeah. in, in neuroscience, there's also an emphasis on increasing the density of sensors and recording from as many neurons as possible or increasing the spatial resolution of brain imaging to be able to have the smallest unit of tissue that you can. And um, I would argue if you could record from every neuron in the brain and make that data set freely available to everyone in the world, we would not have any extra insight into how the brain works. <laughs> <laughs> wow. that you do, the, the conceptual model is critical. And uh, there's thousands of examples from perception science and, and cognitive psychology where a phenomenon has been uh, characterized as an optical illusion. And then neuroscientists have found neural correlates of that in the brain. And um, I'm not sure there's a single example of just pure physiological observations predicting some perceptual cogni cognitive phenomenon, and then that turned out to be true. So all of the insights and ideas and concepts are going the other direction. Part of that is just that neuroscience is a very young field, and the recording methods are, are very young. But you're absolutely right that the, the concept is, is essential. You can't really get anywhere without a, a solid theoretical model. So I guess I had a question, uh, more of a meta question about different types of connections, not neuron connections, but the connections between the, the three of you and the, the fact that you're kind of asking questions of, of similar types of data sets or you're dealing with similar volumes of data, certainly all in the, 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 the time domain at least. Um, uh, you know, how, how, did you, how did you find each other? Have you actually worked together? You, your PhD was in seismology. You're a seismologist. You know, we have, we have a significant issue on, in the Berkeley campus in that everyone is awesome, uh, and yet everyone <laughs> tends to be fairly siloed, and it's not until we recognize that we have kind of a, a, a need for somebody, you know, in, say, the stats department. I, I, I know there's a stats way to think about this, but I, don't, I, I, I can't do it myself. Until we sort of articulate that need, I, I've, I found it pretty hard to just sort of have the kind of water cooler effect where you wind up finding each other um, organically, and I suspect others um, maybe feel the same way here. Uh, it is, it's, it's an awesome place, and the people here are awesome, but it, it sometimes feels to me that we're kind of lacking the, the connective tissue, and, and a bunch of us are thinking about how to just sort of, you know, kind of create those connections more organically. So maybe you could, I, I, don't, I don't want to put you on the spot. Have you ever talked about, you know, sort of problems together, for instance? So we have. We had a, I was on a committee for one of uh, the students in the statistics department, but I think there could be a lot more. And, and this is, comes to, I wanted to comment on your last slide, the novelty square challenge. That, of course, is a very exciting prospect, and I completely agree that's what we should be aiming for, but I don't think that that is all that we should be aiming for. I mean, I think that there are many problems that domain scientists need tools 
that people in the statistics department would be fine, very mundane and very boring, but still we have to discover them, right? And so what we need to do is come up with some sort of framework where we can connect people with the tools they're looking for. I mean, right now we could use tools for our analysis, we could use technical tools for our data collection, and we need to create a way that we can uh, identify those, make use of those, and I think that that process would then lead to the novelty square type problems when you suddenly realize that you've run out of the mm. kind of tool that you want. And so for me, as I think about this, I think of this being something like what the, the role that the library pl has played for the last 200 years, right? When you want to go and dis uh, discover something, you would go to the library. Well, we need that kind of infrastructure to be able to find tools and technologies. Uh, so since we're among friends, including our friends on the internet who will be watching this later, um, I'll, I'll make some rude comments. Um, <laughs> <coughs> I, I think that we really are at an interesting tipping point because up until very, very recently, the attitude that I saw among physicists, cosmologists, um, astrophysicists was largely, you know, first of all, axiom one, the physicists are the smartest people in the room. Um, axiom two, you know, whatever comes up in a physics problem is physics. Um, and so the, the consequence of this is there's really no reason for physicists to talk to anybody else about what happens in a physics problem. Um, and so what, what's changing is there's a greater recognition that there are some, some themes that cut across more than one discipline and some people who have expertise in that and maybe it's worth talking to them. Yeah. Um, so and I, I guess I, I can get away with saying that partly because I'm some flavor of physicists historically. Um, so I, I think it's a really interesting time. I, in, in thinking about how to define data science, um, I kind of came up with the idea that it's maybe uh, a union of intersections. Um, so it, if you have a tool that's useful in more than one you know, data-oriented discipline, so you have the, it, it, those tools that are, that are in the intersection of two or more disciplines and then the union of all such tools, right? That somehow, if it's useful only in one place, then maybe it really is just physics. Um, but if it's useful in other places, then maybe it's data science, maybe it generalizes. So. So, um, yeah, some of my best friends are physicists, so I can also say that the, the, this... <laughs> Cosmologists, well. too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, so it, I think you're absolutely right. We, we need you. We need your cohort, right? We need statisticians and computer scientists like never before. But I, I think the novelty square statement is also that I believe that you need us as well um, because we're creating, you know, real-world problems, although we're astronomers, not that real-world. Um, we're creating real-world problems that, that are novel, and, and you, you all need to um, start creating, you know, tools and frameworks and theories on, on your end that actually, you know, surface the novelty on our end. And, and I think you need us to basically give structure to what's, what's important with the types of data we actually have. So I, I completely agree. Um, well, let me... I'll elaborate on it a little bit. So th there's a couple of different issues that, that, you know, come up in this. So first of all, I think, you know, good applied statistics is statistics in service of a real scientific problem. You can't do it in a vacuum, and there's an awful lot of methodology that's developed, you know, with the hope that perhaps someday there will be something that satisfies the assumptions of the methodology, right? And there's also a lot of misapplication of things because you just say, well, it's in a book. It's got to be, you know, applicable. Um, so I absolutely think that you know, the best applied statistics is done in service of a, a new scientific problem. That said, there are an awful lot of existing tools that, that could be put to good use in many applied disciplines, and I think we're seeing the same issues around the um, uh, academic second-tier status of data science in some sense coming up in that, in that direction, because an academic statistician who's devoting um, his or her time to simply telling you what button to push in an existing software package is not going to get a lot of academic credit. It's not an earthquake, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> is there a sensor? Did you pick up the vibration? Um, so, so it, it, you know, we don't, it doesn't help to be you know, the slave or the, you know, someone who amounts to being the programmer for, you know, for the job. It doesn't help academically. So I don't know how to, how to deal with that in such a way that science gets the best deal and the people who are helping also get a good deal. I, I want to just so, do a quick I, poll. But yeah, well, I, I just wanted to make sure that we, we also open it now also to the floor. So, so, but, but if you wanted to... Well, let me do, let me, I, just for my own curiosity, how many would, would, in the audience would consider yourself a data scientist, by whatever definition? Okay, and how many of you um, would uh, consider yourself a data-driven scientist? 
Okay. How many of you would say that the work that you're doing is inherently multidisciplinary? It's a pretty good, pretty good mix. I think we have a biased sample here. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Uh, so that, that was just my own curiosity. So uh, let, you, let you. Yeah, no, I, we also that. wanted to make sure that we leave, we leave time. And as I said, there will be coffee and tea and cookies outside. But, uh, but we, have, we have a great team here. I don't know, uh, Michael, also in trying to make sure that the, we, we're sort of four out of five physicists of some variety in the panel <laughs> and trying not to drive the stereotype any worse than we already have. <laughs> uh, also wanted to give you a chance to, to comment before we open it to the floor. To comment on uh, if, if you have anything else, <laughs> what's that? Uh, and the question of, of the arrogance of physicists. That's, the, that's <laughs> yes, the, apparently the smartest ones in the room. So <laughs> I'll, I'll play the other. No, not on that, that question. <laughs> hopefully, uh, but uh, no, I'm happy to take uh, comments from the audience. Yes, and, and so please, if uh, there, we have a microphone, so if you have any questions for our panelists, please, and if uh, or suggestions of how to stimulate data-driven science on campus. Yeah, so for those of you that raised your hand, uh, you know, who said you were interdisciplinary, how did you find somebody who, you know, is your, your, your counterpart on the other side of that, of that discipline? And, and please, when you, when you ask a question, do tell us who you are. Part of what we're trying to do here, as I said, is build community. So don't simply ask a question. Tell us who you are on campus and what department you are so that we can find you later. So, so oh, oh, Fred, hold on, Fritz. That, that, what, um, hello, I'm Shannon Nulon. I'm actually visiting from, I'm visiting from Stanford. It's, it's a question from Michael. Um, I found your comment very useful about uh, essentially if they got the output from every neuron in the brain and put it together in the data set, we would discover perhaps not as much as we think we would discover. What, therefore, do you think of, say, the Henry Markram project that the European Union has just invested a billion euro in? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of similar projects that attempt to do the same but on the basis of fMRI locations. Uh, and thirdly, at a rather uh, comic level, since the neuroscience physics thing has come up, what did you think of the argument that Sheldon had with Amy about whether neuroscience could be reduced to physics or vice versa in the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> wow. Well, for better force, I'm more qualified to talk about the, the first two uh, data science initiatives. And I haven't seen a TV show, so. Um. So I, I think with, uh, with the proper, so uh, as, as a way of background, the Henry Markram initiative uh, that's going on in Europe is, um, in, in a sense, I think, as I understand it, is uh, trying to simulate a very small portion of cerebral cortex based on all of the synaptic connectivity and uh, physiological responses of neurons, simulated neurons. And um, it's far from my area of working with humans and non-invasive measurements, but uh, I think that kind of detailed measurement will ultimately be critical for testing models. I'm not sure that the strength of our models and the kind of fundamental principles with which to build a simulation is really there yet, uh, but I think the field is so young, it's premature to really close off any areas, and so those the kinds of data will absolutely be critical at some point, whether they will prove to be useful in the short term until we sort of catch up with a, a more sound, uh, anatomical and physiological based model of what neurons are doing, I think it remains to be seen. Um, and there's, there's a parallel um, um, initiative that, that was announced recently by the Obama administration, and it's a very similar kind of question about well, what we really need to do is now take these methods and record from as many different sites as possible, and then somehow the, uh, the answers to brain function are going to uh, spontaneously emerge from these, uh, these large data sets with these very finely spaced sensors. Um, and so I'm not against collecting those data. They will uh, ultimately be very helpful, but uh, it's, it's unclear. Uh, they, they may be sort of in stasis for a while until the theoretical side catches up. Fritz, yeah. and again, please tell us who you are for those of you. Yes, yeah, so I'm Fritz Sommer. I'm from the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience here. And um, so, uh, yeah, so, so I just want to address also the question, how do we go about establishing data science here on, on campus. And, and I think one interesting thing is really that data, I mean, it sounds a little bit dry, dry data science. And also if we then say, well, people out of frustration will turn to it. So, but I, I think it's really, what is very exciting is that it's, it's a common currency that really kind of uh, brings now together methods driven research and really problem driven research. And, um, 
an interesting way, I think, also to establish it is to, br to popularize the problems that people have in the field. So, be, uh, so, so for example, at the Redwood Center, we are, we are holding every summer two, two week summer calls for students that are quantitatively trained and have usually not too much idea about what neuroscience is. And we explain them the problems. Of course, also the methods that we use right now, but what we hope is that we can actually bring interest into these other domains and make them think more broadly about science and, and, and start to think about neuroscience. And I think this is also a really a, an opportunity we should use, so, so not only trying to popularize our methods that we have as statisticians or, or theorists, but also think of, uh, you know, if we have a, a, an interesting science problem, how can we actually communicate that, that into other communities? And can I briefly ask you before you turn over the mic, um, what kind of mix of students do you get? Because I imagine you guys have background data. Is it mostly people who are going to do neuroscience, or do you it's, get a, um, a healthy maybe, mix of disciplines? I would say it's about 50% of people who already decided that they want to get your, themselves in, into neuroscience. Some of them already are PhD students in the neuroscience lab, mm -hmm. but want to do, tackle a problem that requires a lot of quantitative methods. And the others are, they just come from physics, computer science, statistics, mathematics, and they are just somehow excited. They see, 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 they see this as, a, as an area where, where they can apply their skills and interests. Thank you. I think we have one question over there. If we could pass, send the microphone over. And again, please let us know who you are. Hi, I'm Simona Zompi. I'm the director of the Center for Global Public Health. And we are right now um, reviewing um, uh, a new program, Master in Science and Global Health. And I would really like to add some data science in there because I think this is the next, I mean, for the next generation, uh, that's where the, the, the jobs will be. And so I'm wondering, like, how can we integrate that to which level and to which schools I should look into to, to try to integrate this into the global health uh, MS? I mean, one thing I'll just react to immediately, I don't have an answer to you, actually, but um, is that what I'm, I'm, sh I'm, I'm really, I've been surprised by, but I should stop being surprised by, is that when we talk about data science and we talk about how we connect with each other, um, it's, it's inevitable that fundamentally what we wind up talking about is education, right, and, how, and about training, um, because that, that's where all, all of this great science starts, is with the next generation uh, of students. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it's come up, right? We, we've just now brought it up. Um, and, and so I, I think it is as, as fundamental in, in thinking about building communities amongst, you know, established researchers uh, we also want to be thinking about building those communities amongst, um, you know, uh, amongst the students and amongst a population that doesn't know any better yet that you have to be siloed and you have to you know, sort of tag yourself with I do this, this, and this so that you can get a job in a certain department. Um, you know, at, at some level, working, working with students who you know, are, are interested in solving problems and bringing whatever um, toolkits uh, are needed uh, to bear on the problem to do it, uh, that's where I think we have a, a chance for a really great impact. So again, I didn't answer your, I didn't answer your question. So um, this is perhaps germane to the question. I've been talking to Josh and Fernando and Aaron Kulich about um, coming up with an upper division course in uh, reproducible and collaborative data science um, that would be cross-listed in a handful of departments such as uh, computer science, statistics, astronomy, and I don't, I don't know where else, but maybe this is an opportunity to have something that your students could take, depending on how many of them there are. Or and this is going to be in the fall, right? Uh, we're doing this as an upper division seminar uh, listed in CS and statistics this fall, but that's on a pilot basis to try to develop something that's more overarching. It might even be a two-semester sequence. Um, you know, just sort of introduction to a variety of tools that people find useful in, in working collaboratively and reproducibly um, with data, uh, especially um, large-scale data. So good hygiene around um, coding and, and, and this and that and, and sort of computational tools that come up in a broad variety of disciplines and so forth and so on. I'm a little bit, you know, skeptical of data science as a thing that is taught, you know, somehow as a subject on its own 
um, in the same way that I'm a little bit skeptical about statistics as an undergraduate major, despite its popularity. Sort of, if you want to go on and do really good work in something, you really need substantive knowledge in, you know, in some underlying field and the ability to go out and figure out what tools are useful to you. And I think a better background is somehow not some particular toolkit, but ways of thinking and, some, and, and something you can actually dig, your, dig into. That's me. I think we had one more question. Maybe, maybe we'll wrap it up there with you so that I don't keep people from their lunches, but also from coffee. Please. Well, it's, it's quite related, actually. So I'm a PhD candidate with a background in robotics and computer science, but I actually work in public health and with atmospheric scientists who use low-cost sensors. Um, not all training it really occurs in the classroom. So well, since this is about time series, I'll phrase it this way. Um, how have your changing views on this topic and the relevance of data science, how are they reflected in changes in the way that you train your graduate students? Um, so I, I'll react to that. Uh, you know, what I, what I saw, uh, I did a poll basically of all the things that I required my graduate students to be good at, or at least know a lot, a lot about. And, you know, it was a whole bunch of different types of databases. It was a whole bunch of different um, programming languages. Uh, it was domain knowledge. Um, and I know I wasn't taught that way. And so with my students uh, at, the, at, the, at the graduate level, the ones that I'm mentoring, um, a, a large amount of their training is certainly not happening in the classroom. It's saying, you know, now we need to talk about how we're going to actually store all this data and move it around on network and do parallel computing. Um, you know, some of it's by osmosis, some of it's directed. But the, the requirements to do the things that I do in, in, my, in my lab and in my work are quite large. And um, one of the reasons why I started um, this uh, Python boot camp uh, with, with Fernando and company is the recognition that I was asking people to come into my lab who, you know, who knew Python. And it turns out no one in astronomy was being trained in, in Python and they didn't have time as an undergrad to take, you know, a bunch of computer science classes um, and so part of the, the, the reason for the creation of the boot camp was essentially better put my, my money where my mouth is um, and, or my time where my mouth is. That's the same thing, actually. Um, and, uh, and we started that as essentially a labor of love, right? So we don't get teaching credit for this, but we're expecting something like 300 students um, in the fall for this. And then we jump into a seminar class to teach people how to be data-driven scientists in the Python language just because... I need my students to know how to do that. So one of the great things about being at a, at a, at a university and, and trying to do research is you wind up figuring out where the deficiencies are um, at the undergraduate level when you wind up seeing sort of a, a cohort of people coming in, not with the skill sets that you think that they need. And then you can just create classes that get, you know, get to them early, not the same people, but you know, they're, they're equivalent. So um, it's had a tremendous impact um, on the way uh, that I teach and, and what I teach. So do we have, yeah, if we have any quick last words from you guys, um, by all means. Well, I, I thought it was very interesting, your comments about that education and statistics. If, if I understood correctly that uh, sometimes there's, uh, you can get a very uh, solid knowledge of statistics, but it's important to be able to have a concrete field to be able to apply it to for it to be truly useful statistics. And, uh, I would certainly rather see an applicant to our PhD program who was either a math major or a physicist than somebody who was an undergraduate statistics major. So in a sense, we have the opposite problem in biological sciences, where yeah. there's a lot of very concrete knowledge, not much in the way of unifying principles in biology. And so people learn a great deal about the specifics of the system or the organism they're studying. Um, and that's a big part of our curriculum, classroom curriculum. Uh, and then for research projects, they're often very siloed in very particular model systems. Uh, and a lot of our students, and this this includes you know, myself and Peter's as faculty members. We've learned statistics as we went along to solve particular problems and learn programming that we need to do to get the job done. And we don't really have a broad foundation, and we don't really know all those areas that we've not been exposed to that would be maybe really useful for our problem. And I think we would all benefit from having much more formal uh, education in statistics and computing that's part of a graduate curriculum in neuroscience or biology as well, and maybe less of the actual facts about the uh, particulars in biology. I, I, I didn't mean to imply that, that learning some statistics as an undergraduate was, was not a good thing to do. It was more the idea of <laughs> <laughs> majoring in it that, 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 yeah. uh, that I'm, I'm a little bit... Yeah. Yeah. As the chair of the stats department, I'm yeah. sure that <laughs> <laughs> you didn't mean so to just say just a subliminal message to reduce the pressure on the major. <laughs> but I, I see how many students in our program have been attracted to the Python Bootcamp and other programs that you guys have, have organized. It's, it seems obvious that it's filling a need that's not currently being addressed by the curriculum as they are. 
questions. If I can amplify this, because I think this is key, and in answer to the question, I mean, I think that we require our students to really have the domain knowledge in seismology and geophysics, and I think that that's really important, and I don't think that should ever change, and I don't think that will change. But at the same time, they're then left to pick up these skills, as Josh was saying, largely on their own. And so how do we really facilitate uh, uh, progression? It's by creating these kinds of uh, opportunities for them to plug into these, these tools that they need. Boot camp is a great example. But there could be so many more that we could do on campus. And I think that would make a, a huge difference to what we're able to do. Well, here, here's a plea, perhaps, to VCR. I'm not, not sure uh, exactly. But I, I would love to teach a graduate level introduction to statistics for physical science or for science, you know, more generally. The problem is we don't have, you know, we don't have the FTE, we don't have the resources. We, you know, if, if I'm teaching that, I'm not teaching something else. But it would be a really, really good thing to do. I mean, on enough um, physics uh, PhD committees, uh, astronomy PhD committees, computer science or electrical engineering PhD committees, um, the occasional earth science PhD committees, you know that the, the, there's, you know, there's simple stuff that could really improve things, but they're not getting a chance to learn it. So. I just want to react to that. Um, what, what, I, what I wind up hearing is we say we've got this boot camp and you're starting a class and you'd like to have one FTE. What it's pretty clear is I think is emerging is that we need to have a formal structure on campus. And I don't know what that is yet, um, but I, I'm starting to see that this shouldn't be done piecemeal and you know, I just have to create this boot camp because you know, otherwise I'm, I'm not really sort of living up to my educational mission. Um, I think if we were able to wrap around it and say the job of this entity is to do all of these things in a coherent way where it's not just one boot camp and another one, but they're actually all sort of connected to each other and it's not just you know, one course at the undergraduate level, another at a graduate level, but an entire curriculum of, of how to do this and, and not necessarily in, an, in, an, in its own right, but you know, maybe in concert with, with other curricula. So I, I think what we're hearing is this sort of kind of burbling need for a, a, a larger structure on campus. I think we'll wrap it up with you so that... Okay, I'm Matthew Bales from Swinburne University in Australia. Um, do you think one of the problems is that Berkeley encourages only new academics who are going to be leaders and you don't have anybody who's like a really good scientist but doesn't want to be on the front cover of Nature or Science and doesn't want to do work for somebody else to make their career better, but they want to be the, the PI on everything, and that you'd, you'd be better off having a, a more diverse section of academics you're hiring, some of whom are like really smart, but they're just not, they don't have the egos of, of <laughs> some of the people on stage, perhaps. There's a, there's a great Gary Larson cartoon that, that has, it, it's an, another case of too many scientists and not enough hunchbacks. <laughs> It's probably a perfect... A perfect Nana, why didn't you take that one? Yeah. <laughs> a perfect, a perfect as, as the one member here of this panel who is not tenured faculty on campus, uh, I, I would like our university to react to that in a, in a positive way. Let's put, let's put it that way, and who's not on the cover of Science or Nature. Uh, but uh, I don't want to keep you people f uh, from your lunch, from, uh, from uh, tea and coffee and cookies, but I do want to thank uh, Kai and Cassie and the VCR for getting this effort started. This is the first one. We're alpha testing this thing. Please let us know uh, how this series can be made better. Help us. Uh, the, the email, the mailing list, data science at calmail.berkeley.edu is how we're kind of broadcasting this information. So you can let us know if you think you have a great speaker in mind, a topic that needs to be addressed, somebody who maybe is visiting you from out of town and would, would be a perfect, a perfect person who's in town for a few days. We're trying to have these once a month uh, regularly for the foreseeable future. Um, so hopefully this is the start of a useful community and a useful discussion on campus around things that are both instrumental to the university but also a very broad scientific impact I think is clear. So thanks everyone for coming and thank you for our panelists and our speakers. <laughs>